This is a, an introduction to composting, and I'm going to assume that you know, I know nothing about composting. We'll start right at the beginning. The first half of the program is general information about what it is and, and what happens during the process. And then the second half of the program, we're going to look at different types of composting methods. And each one will be just an overview to give you a, a taste of what they're about. There, there is no best composting method. It, it's very much a matter of fitting the right method to what you want to accomplish and your situation. And so some of you will fit into different categories here. So what is composting? Well, here's the start of some composting. We've got a bunch of uh, kitchen scraps and we we have some plant cuttings in there and we all this organic matter and we're going to turn this into something we call compost but what exactly is that and I actually think most people who even do composting don't really understand what's going on here and I think it's important to understand this not only for composting but a lot of other things we do in the garden will make more sense if you understand this process so I look on this picture here and I can see a lemon and an eggshell and a tomato piece and some grapes and some banana skins. And so we can identify all of these pieces and they, they look pretty big to us. They're actually all plant structures. See, everything we see there are plant cells and they're still in their original structure form. And inside those cells, we have all kinds of molecules. Some are the nutrient molecules that plants need, so things like potassium and nitrate. But many of the molecules are very large molecules, things like protein, starch, carbohydrates, fats. And, and you've heard all of these. Lignans you might not have heard about. Uh, that's a special type of carbohydrate material, and it gives plants uh, strength and structure. It's, it's what makes a tree stand upright. Now, most of the nutrients inside these kitchen scraps are found inside of these large molecules. So as the plant grows and the banana tree makes its bananas, it's creating all these large molecules and that's what makes up a banana. Composting is the opposite of that process. Now it's going to take all of these large molecules and turn them into smaller and smaller molecules until we get down to nutrients. And the nutrients is what plants can use. None of this is of any use to a plant. And so here's a picture of a protein. Proteins are really complicated molecules. They can have up to 100,000 different atoms in there. But from our perspective, what's important is that proteins are these large, large molecules that contain a fair amount of nitrogen. So about 16% of a protein is nitrogen. And nitrogen is the most important nutrient for plant growth. And that's why these proteins are so important. But this is huge. And plants couldn't possibly do anything with it. If I take this protein and put it beside a plant root, the plant will die because it can't get enough nitrogen. It cannot use these large molecules. Here's an interesting molecule you might recognize. It's DNA. It has this double helix structure. And in the middle, you can see some blue specks. And those blue specks are phosphate molecules. They're inside the DNA. But again, if I take this molecule and put it beside a plant, absolutely useless to the plant because it can't get those nutrients. When we're finished composting, we have something that looks like this. And to our eyes, everything is gone. You know, there's no banana peel there. The grape is missing. There's no plant material that I've cut off and put in here. It's all gone and we've got this nice brown or black crumbly type of material. To our eyes, we now think that the composting process is finished. That's a big mistake. We have to understand that the composting process is just moved along to a point where our eyes can't see the original pieces. But the majority of the nutrients in this compost are still tied up in large molecules. But our eyes are just so useless for looking at molecules that we can't see this. But if we had a real strong microscope and we went in, we'd see that 
we still have all these big molecules. We still have protein and DNA molecules. In fact, we still have whole cells in there that are protecting all that. Very few nutrients for plants at this stage. This is a banana peel, and we could take this and just throw it on the ground, and it will go black like this, and over a period of time, it will compost. Now, we don't use the word compost in this case. We, we call it rotting or decomposition. But those three terms actually describe the exact same process on a chemical level. We start with these large molecules and it's slowly being converted into smaller and smaller molecules. And composting and rotting are the same thing. I think we call it composting when a gardener does it. And when you just throw this on the ground somewhere, we call it rotting. So what's the secret in this process? Why does this process actually happen? Well, the secret is microbes. Microbes take large molecules and turn them into small molecules. The microbes are basically eating this stuff. And in their digestion process, they slowly digest this into smaller and smaller microbes. Microbes are really the key to this. In fact, I was giving a talk yesterday at a Hort Society, and someone came up and asked me an interesting question. Uh, she said, you know, what's really going on in this compost? And, and does it continue to degrade? And why does it continue to degrade? And I said to her, I said, well, if we took compost or, or we take a banana peel or a grape, it doesn't matter, something organic, and we heat treat that. So we kill all the microbes, completely sterile now, and we keep it sterile. Nothing happens. There's no rotting. There's no composting taking place. Without the microbes, nothing really happens to this stuff. They're the key to make it happen. Now, here's an interesting fact that many gardeners don't understand. So we have something we call finished compost. Okay, so we, we pile it up and we turn it and we take care of it for a few months. And now we have this black stuff. You know, the grapes are gone. We call this finished compost. And, and we think that this is finished material. We put it in the garden and plants use it. But that's not true. The decomposition process is going to continue for about a five-year period. So when I take finished compost and put it in the soil, a little bit of nutrients come out and then the microbes will continue to slowly digest this for five years, continually adding some nutrients to the soil. And that's really one of the benefits of this material. It's a very slow, constant feed, and that's perfect for plant growth. But the important thing to understand is that it's not finished. We just happen to call it finished. So what happens during a traditional composting process? And here we're looking at hot composting. You've probably heard that, and, and this is sort of the dream of a lot of people who want to get into composting. They want to do really good hot composting. Well, what happens during that process? So on the left side here, we're measuring temperature, and on the bottom is time. So we make this compost pile, and we're at the very left side of this graph. And over time, we go through something called the initiation phase. And the temperature starts rising at that point. Then we go through a thermophilic phase and we reach a maximum temperature and then the pile starts cooling off. And then we go through a fairly long maturation process. And the temperature is slowly dropping, dropping, dropping. And at the end of this chart, we have finished compost. There's interesting things happening here. One, of course, is the temperature profile, which is of interest. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the other thing that happens is that the population of microbes is continually changing throughout this process. So at the beginning, we have a lot of bacteria and fungi in that compost pile. But the fungi are the ones that are most active. And the reason is that plant material has a lot of that lignin that I mentioned. Okay, that's that stuff that keeps plants strong and, and stiff. Bacteria can't digest that. They can't eat it. Fungi can. So fungi start by taking those big pieces. They take a whole stem of a plant and they start digesting that, breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces. Once the proteins are released, then bacteria can come in and they can attack the proteins. So over time, that population changes. 
in that initiation phase, it's mostly fungi that are doing all the work. Then through the thermophilic phase, the bacteria take over. And they're the most popular organism that's doing the composting. And then in maturation, both fungi and bacteria are active. But the actual fungi and bacteria that are there at any particular time changes. This isn't one set that is there all the time. So you can take this compost pile and look at it every couple of days and you'll see a completely different set of microbes. Different species will be in there. They're constantly changing. Some bacteria like cooler temp, some like hotter temperature. And when the temperature is just right for them, that particular bacteria starts becoming very active. And then if it gets too hot, then it stops becoming active and a different one takes over. So we have this constant change of microbes. So I want to have a look at this hot business. You know, why does a compost pile actually get hot? If we take a step back and think of ourselves, when we exercise, we sweat. We get hot and we sweat. The reason for that is our bodies are actually degrading large molecules. It's taking carbohydrates and fats and we're turning that into sugars, which are smaller molecules. And then our body acts on the sugars and we convert that sugar into CO2 and energy. That's what keeps us alive. Our bodies need that energy. And every living organism goes through this. We take large molecules, we slowly digest them, we extract the energy, and we produce water and CO2. And when we breathe out, we're letting go of that excess CO2 that our body has produced. So the heat is there because we're digesting these molecules. Well, in a compost pile, the same thing happens. Microbes are not that different from you and I. Their biochemistry is almost identical. I mean, you're basically a bacteria. Bacteria do the same thing. They take carbohydrates and digest them into sugars, and then they take the sugars and convert them to uh, CO2 and water, and they get energy out of that, and that creates heat. So in a compost pile, what happens is that the microbes become more and more active, and when there's more of them and they're more active and they're eating more and more and faster and faster, it generates a lot of heat, and that's why that compost pile gets hot. Now, there's things you can do to make hot composting. Uh, one is the size of the pile. So if you have a small pile, so this is, you know, a foot across, uh, it generates heat, just like I've described, but it never generates enough that you'd be able to feel it. You need to get to a certain size before you really get it hot enough. And the reason people like hot composting is that the hotter it gets, the faster it composts. And that's really the benefit. There's really no benefit to the end product for the hotness. Cold composting also happens. It's just a slower process. But the end result of both hot and cold composting is the same. It's small molecules where all the nutrients have been released so that plants can use them. Uh, moisture is important for hot composting, uh, in part because all of these microbes, they don't actually live on dry stuff. They need moisture. They actually live inside water. And so the microbes that are living on plants, they need a water cushion between them and the plants. The microbes that are in soil, they actually live in layers of water. They're very thin layers, but they need that water. And so moisture is very important for them. They also like air. We add extra air to this because, well, they're like us. As they're getting energized and they're working really hard, they need oxygen. They need air to breathe in. That's part of the process. Uh, hot composting works better in summer, particularly in colder climates. So this time of year in Ontario, where it's pretty cold, you're not getting any composting happening tonight, I can guarantee it. So most hot composting will happen in summer in colder climates. In hotter climates, it's a year-round thing. And then we get to this mysterious thing called browns and greens. And you have to get the browns and greens in the right proportions to make hot composting happen. You can have a closer look at browns and greens. So here's a slide that compares the browns and greens. And it says, for hot composting, we want three parts brown and one part green. Now, a lot of places say that. But in fact, it's, it's a useful tool, but it's misinformation. 
composting has very little to do with browns and greens and quite honestly it can get gardeners very confused about this uh, for instance if we have a look at the green side here with the top item there is called grass clippings freshly cut grass is considered green because it has a high nitrogen composition but if we let it sit for a few days it goes brown and it loses the nitrogen so old grass is actually a brown and not a green and it's not really clear when it jumps from one side to the other. Coffee grounds is interesting. Coffee grounds are brown. I mean, you know they're brown. They're almost black. And yet we're calling them green. So this is a useful tool. It's not really good to use browns and greens. There's all kinds of problems with that. It's much better to look at the CN ratio. This is the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And when you build a compost pile, you want a ratio of 30. So you want 30 molecules of carbon for each molecule of nitrogen. Or in fact, this is a mass. So you want like 30 pounds of carbon to one pound of nitrogen. And if you have that ratio, then you will get hot compost. Why is it 30 and how did we come up with that number? Well, it turns out that when bacteria are really happy, they like a CN ratio of about 25. But as they eat this stuff, the value will come down. So we started at 30 and microbes are pretty happy at 30 and they will slowly digest this stuff and the ratio will drop down to 25 and even to 20 before it's finished. And that middle number, that 25, that's when bacteria are really happy, right? So we're picking a ratio that is perfect food for microbes. So they have lots to eat. They're really happy and they process this quickly. If the ratio is higher than this, for instance, a pile of old dry leaves will have a ratio probably around 100. It's a slow process. The bacteria never really get going because there's not enough nitrogen for them to eat the leaves. 30 works out really well. If we get too far the other way, so we might have a CN ratio of 10, then we get a lot of rotting taking place. And we have bacteria in there that we don't want. Things get slimy and they don't process properly. So we want this happy ratio. So people say, okay, I want my 30. I want a hot composting. Well, this is done on a weight basis. And most people mix a whole bunch of stuff together. So you have some kitchen waste, you've got some fall leaves, some coffee grounds and so on. You actually have to go and calculate all these and then weigh them all and then mix them so you get the right ratio. And that's really complicated. Nobody's going to bother to do that unless you're really serious about this. The, the book there is a book I wrote on compost science. And first of all, it has a list of all these CN ratios, but it actually introduces a new way to do this that's a little easier. And you take your material and you put it into three piles. The blue pile, the A there, is a CN ratio of less than 30. So that's your kitchen scraps, your coffee grounds, and so on. Then you have anything from 30 to 100, so your leaves can go into that pile. And then anything over 100, and that's things like straw, for instance, is, is high. And then you simply follow this formula. If you, you take two scoops of blue and one scoop of the middle greenish colored one, and you throw it on the pile. And for every scoop of yellow, you put in uh, eight scoops of blue. And you don't have to weigh anything and you don't have to count things and so on. So this is a simple process. If you do this, you will get hot compost, provided the pile is big enough, you get your moisture level right and so on. If you do this and you don't have the other things, then it'll just cook a little slower, but it will still make finished compost. So CN ratio is important if you want fast compost. It's not so important if you want slow compost. And that kind of answers that question. Does it have to be hot? And the answer is no. You can take any kind of organic matter and drop it on the ground and it will compost. So people ask the question, well, what can you compost? The answer is that you can compost everything. But there are some things you may not want to compost for a variety of reasons. So I've pictured some eggshells here. Uh, lots of gardeners think that adding eggshells to their garden is a great thing. I eat it stops slugs, it adds nutrients to the garden, and so on. Those are all myths. It doesn't stop slugs at all. Eggshells don't decompose. In fact, I did a little study where I took some eggshells and I buried them 
And over a five-year period, every year I would go out and dig up one of these eggshells and look at it. And after five years, they were still intact. There was no decomposition visible. And in fact, archaeologists who dig up sites that, that are 100, 200 years old, they actually can identify what type of birds people were eating by the eggshells, whether it was chickens or ducks and so on, because the eggshells are still there. So in most soil, eggshells do nothing. Here's some other things that you may or may not want. So a lot of people will not put meat into their compost pile. Uh, meat will compost. That's not a problem. But it also tends to attract rodents. And people don't like having skunks and rats in their compost pile. And it does compost a little slow. But there's no reason you couldn't use it. Uh, bones is another one that attracts rodents. And bones really don't decompose. So after many months, they'll still be there as bones. So maybe that's not the best thing to add. The third one there is kind of interesting, compostable plastic. Our society uh, is so interested in being eco-friendly that we will do anything that sounds like it's good for the environment. So compostable plastic, hey, that's great. Well, there is such a thing as compostable plastic, but the reality is that there are virtually no facilities in North America that can actually compost it. There isn't any in Canada. There are a few in the States. It takes high temperatures and a much longer processing time. And so most facilities can't compost plastic. So no matter what it says on the plastic, don't put it in your compost pile because it's still going to be there. Rose clippings, they compost slowly. And I don't put them in because those thorns always get stuck in my fingers later. So I take those out and actually throw them away. Weeds, there's some pluses and minuses. Uh, as long as they don't have a lot of seeds in them, they can be composted. And to be honest with you, I think even the seeds aren't a problem. But some people won't put weeds in that are seedy, that have already developed the seeds. Uh, pet waste is one of those things we can debate. A lot of people won't use pet waste because you can get diseases from it. If this is your pet, then you've already touched their poop. You've touched the pet. You've got their stuff all over you. Uh, you might as well compost their waste as well. Now, I kind of understand that you may not want to compost pet waste from the pet down the street because you don't know what problems that pet might have. But the reality is that most of these problems are highly exaggerated and won't cause a problem. So that's general composting. Uh, now let's have a look at some methods. The most common way to do composting is this way, and I called it piles, bins, and tumblers. They're all a little different, but they're all fairly similar. So piles are your traditional way of composting where you make piles. Uh, the picture here shows a fairly common type of composting system that a lot of cities sell uh, from time to time, usually in the springtime. These all work quite well. Uh, they come in various sizes. So a lot of them are smaller and they fit into a backyard where you may not want a really big pile, but you want something smaller. They're easy to use. You know, you can, you can buy these or you can just use a barrel and make your own. So you don't have much expense at all. If they're big enough, they will do hot composting. But most of the smaller ones will not do hot compost. They're slower in making that compost. But as I said, they eventually make compost and they work quite well. This is all outdoor stuff, okay? None of this is really designed to be done indoors. So if you have a backyard and you want to do some composting, these are all good options for you. But I'll just show you a couple of them here. So this is your traditional bin system. Uh, they're typically four by four by four. They can be made out of a variety of different things. Uh, you typically put the material in and layer it and, and then mix it up. They do take some space. They're usually not the prettiest things to have in your backyard, so that may be a negative for you. But if you want to make a lot of compost, this is the way to go. And that's also a problem, right? We have smaller backyards these days, and most people will have trouble filling one of these. Unless you go out and you collect leaves from the neighborhood and you buy some straw or you get some organic material from other sources and bring them here. You know, maybe you pick up a load of manure and so on. 
you won't have enough material from the, the typical backyard to fill one of these. And if you don't fill it, then there's no point in having big bins. Here's a easier way to do this. You just get some wire. This is chicken wire and you make some sort of a shape and you throw the stuff in there. And this is a really easy way to make a bin. Uh, these are popular. Uh, you can purchase these. This particular picture is, is, I think, is an antique one, but they are still available. There are newer models and there are lots of DIY models here. So the idea here is that we have some doors here and I can open the door, put in my material, and I can just put a bit in as I get it. So this is great for a kitchen, right? So once a week you take kitchen scraps out here and you put them in this and you just keep adding to it and then we turn it. This is sitting on wheels, so I can very easily turn this material. And it's much easier to turn than the last two systems you've seen. Why is turning important? Remember, oxygen is critical here. First of all, we want to mix this material. So the coffee grounds and, and the banana peel get close together. We want that mixed. The second reason is we want extra oxygen in there. And so by making something that turns easy, you have a system that will speed up the composting process. Now, there are easy ways. You might decide, well, geez, you know, this all sounds like a lot of work and I don't really want to do all this work, but I still want to do some composting. I still have kitchen scraps. I still have some cuttings from the garden that I need to do something with. And I don't want to send them to the city. I want to leave them on my property. So there are a couple of easy methods that you can use. And most of these are almost no work at all. They compost much slower. So that's a disadvantage. And of course, this is outdoor again. And in fact, this is the method that I use for most of my garden. I have a six acre botanical garden. I grow about 3000 different things. And when I first moved into the garden, there was nothing there and I did the traditional things. I built some nice bins and I started hauling the material down there. And I soon realized I had way too much material and it took too much time to haul it around the garden. So I use what I call my uh, cut and drop method. If I cut this flower head off, I just pitch it behind some plants and I just let it rot. In the spring, when I clean up my garden, same thing. I just cut everything and drop it. And in fact, Half the leaves and stuff from last year are already on the ground. I just leave them there. I don't collect it. I don't pile it. They will rot. If you do nothing, remember that rotten black banana peel? You throw that on the ground, it will rot. And I just throw it kind of behind things so it looks a little neater. Uh, this is also a fairly easy way of composting. So this is a combination of raised bed and compost pile. We call these keyhole gardens because you'll notice on the left side there, there's a sort of an entryway to get to the center, and that's the keyhole. And these can be made from all kinds of things. They can be taller, shorter. They can only be six inches tall. They can be made with rocks or wood, or the shapes can be different. But generally, so they're sort of a rounded shape and in the center we have this cylinder that's put in place and we just drop all our garbage in there and it goes down and the worms from the garden come in and they start digesting it it's got lots of uh, microbes from the soil come in and we just keep putting it on top and the material gets digested and moves out into the garden no turning no piling no cn ratios really simple system too much work for you? Well, here's another method. You just collect your fall leaves and you pile them up. And guess what? They will compost. Here's another one that's starting to become more popular. It's called the electric composter. This is the Lomi model, which you may have seen around. There's four or five, maybe 10 other models out there. You basically have a little bucket. You put your kitchen scraps in there. You turn it on. It's electronic. It turns. They claim it grinds, but it doesn't really grind. It sort of does some mixing. It heats up, and you get some stuff out of it. Unfortunately, the manufacturer of these are claiming that this is a composter. In fact, the category of equipment is electronic composter. They make a big deal about how eco-friendly these are. The first thing you have to understand is these don't compost, okay? These things only run for anywhere from four to 12 hours. Composting is a slow process. And in fact, by the way, if you're on uh, YouTube and you see some videos that say, hey, I'm going to show you how to make really fast compost, you run. Compost does not happen fast. 
Now there's things you can do to speed it up a little bit. So instead of six months, it's three months, but nobody makes quick compost. So these things actually don't make compost. What they do is they make dried kitchen scraps. So it does have some advantage in that you can dry it up in the winter time, save it up, and then take it out to your compost pile in the spring or just spread it around your garden as mulch. And then the composting process starts. So it does compact it so the volume is less. It dries it so it doesn't rot, it doesn't smell. And you can just keep it in jars or bags until spring. But if you use this and then put it in your green bin, it's actually worse from the, for the environment than if you didn't use it. And funny thing is, I was driving with my neighbor. He was telling me he has one of these machines, and that's what they do. They, they dry the material, and they think because they're reducing the volume, and they thought it was composting, and putting it in the compost bin, they were doing good thing for the environment. And I'm not surprised because that's what the manufacturers tell you, but all fiction. Uh, these things don't compost. So they're only good if you dry the material and then put it in a garden somewhere. Vermicomposting is very popular and uh, the interest is growing in this. And vermicomposting is just a really fancy way of saying you're going to use worms to do the composting for you. As you probably know, worms eat organic matter. They like eating leaves and so on. Uh, that's actually not true. I shouldn't have said that. They they eat the leaves and they, they eat all your kitchen scraps, but they don't actually like kitchen scraps. What they like is the bacteria that are on those kitchen scraps. And so they ingest relatively big pieces of organic matter because they're coated in bacteria. Bacteria are really, really, really tiny compared to a, a you know banana peel. The other thing that happens with vermicomposting is that there's a lot of exaggeration about what the vermicompost is. So let me set a few things straight. First of all, you might be wondering, well, what, what the heck is a vermicompost here? Basically worm poop. That's what you're making here. So the worm is eating your kitchen scraps and out the other end comes some material and we call that vermicompost. It's basically worm poop. And all kinds of magical things are claimed to happen with this worm poop. Well, the first thing to understand is that it's not actually a composting process. Worms don't compost things. When the food goes into them, they do chop it up. The bacteria in their stomach does help break it up. And so what comes out is organic material that has already been broken down in physical size into fairly small chunks. It's now ready for composting. So you leave that stuff in the bin for another two or three months while the composting actually happens. And then you harvest it and use it. And it is very good for gardens and plants. So there's, there's no issue there. But it's not any better than other types of compost. And when you start with a banana peel, it doesn't matter how you compost it, you end up with the molecules that were in the banana peel. Worms are not adding, adding anything special to that. One of the big reasons people like vermicomposting is that you can do it indoors. When it's done right, it's, it's pretty much odorless. Uh, you can put it in your basement and just leave it. You can do it all winter long, which is something that composting doesn't do very well outside. Right? So those are some advantages for it. Uh, you can buy containers like the one pictured here, or you can make your own. There's lots of DIY solutions on the internet on how to make worm bins. The one thing I think you have to understand about vermicomposting is that it's partly composting and partly taking care of pets. And I think that's important to understand that if you like the worms and you want to take care of these worms, then you probably like vermicomposting. If you don't want to take care of some extra pets, then this may not be for you. You do have to feed these guys. You have to keep moisture levels correct. That's not overly difficult. Uh, you can go away for a couple of weeks on vacation and they're fine on their own, uh, but you can't go away for six weeks and expect them to be alive when you get home. So they are living, breathing pets. Another uh, way of composting is something called Bokashi composting or just Bokashi. This is not as well known, but it's becoming more popular. This is also not composting. I don't know why everyone calls it Bokashi composting. 
there's zero composting taking place here. This is really a fermentation process, very similar to a pickling process, right? We, we start with little cucumbers, we use vinegar and salt, and we end up with pickles, similar to a fermentation process. This does the same thing. So we take this cucumber, we put it in the bucket here, we go through the process, and we end up with a pickle. It still looks like a cucumber, but it has changed in some way. And I'll come back to that in a second. One of the great things about this is that you can do it indoors. These buckets are fairly small. They can fit under your kitchen sink. The process is fairly easy to do. It's airtight, so you put a lid on top, so you have no odors. What you do is you start it up. Uh, every three or four days, you open it up, throw your kitchen scraps in, maybe put in a little of this Bokashi mix, which is a special type of bran, which you can buy or you can make yourself. You close it back up and you wait and you do this for a month or so until the pail is pretty much full. Then you set it aside for two months to continue the fermentation and then you take the stuff out and the stuff you take out is called ferment. It still looks like the original stuff, but it's softer, it's squishier. Now you got to do something with this. This is the one thing that a lot of people don't seem to understand that it's not composted yet. It's, it still looks like a cucumber. It still looks like a banana peel. So now we have to compost. So you either throw it on a compost bin or you bury it in the garden or you mix it with soil, but you have to do something so that the composting actually starts. Now, what's really interesting about Bokashi is I can't find any scientific information that tells me what actually happens during the process to that pickle. I don't know how much is degraded inside, but physically it's still there. So all the cell structures are there, all the cells are there. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this process is that uh, the other composting methods all do produce CO2 and maybe some nitrous oxide, which are gases that are not good for the environment. They're, they're heating up the environment. Bokashi may be the one process that produces the least amount of those gases. So it may actually be a really environmentally friendly process, but I haven't found anyone who's actually measured that well. Uh, so this just shows how it's done. You kind of put it in the bucket. You put in your Bokashi mix. That gives you a good overview of various composting methods. If you'd like to get more in-depth information on those, have a look at my book, Composting Science for Gardeners. Or if you prefer just watching more of my videos, there's a whole library of composting videos right here. Happy composting.